Hello and welcome to Reality Atlas. This is Jeff coming to you from Ireland and Scott coming to you from Cortez Island, British Columbia, Canada. How are, How you, are you today? doing, Scott? I'm doing I'm good. good. I'm I'm down. I'm actually away from home. I'm down in the south of Ireland in a beautiful um, County Kerry, which is my favorite place in this country. So it's always nice to get away for a few days. And we have chosen to talk about a topic which is dear to both our hearts, which is basically like AI and this kind of like um, incredible uh, entrant into the technological world. In the last two years, Scott, was it, when did AI get born? Oh, it's been going on for decades, but it really, the, the big breakthrough was with chat GPT-4 or 3.5, I believe. It's probably about yeah. 18 months ago. Um, and then there was a huge um, upgrade with GPT-4, got really uh -huh. smart. And now with GPT-4 Omni, which has just come out in the last week, um, which is faster and smarter. And um, apparently it hasn't come to me yet, but they're rolling out new features like video. Um, mm. It's able to like look through your camera and tell you what's happening and um, it's really fast to respond and um, it has a, a new breakthrough in, in terms of the, the natural language um, and the subtleties and the inflections in the voice. It's really very much like talking to a person. So um, yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what that's like. Mm. Um, but at this point, and I'm... Uh, it's not, I don't have that update, but I do have the Omni. Uh-huh. I'm really grateful to you, Scott, because, yeah, I mean, like, you're just way more technical than I am, to be honest, and I'm sure you're aware of AI, but in kind of AI's iPhone moment or whatever, like, I never used AI, I kind of just heard the word artificial intelligence, so it was only when ChatGPT came out that I actually used it and went, oh my goodness, this is really good, but I think I might have had some aversions and reservations had it not been for your kind of initial um kind of well i would say promotion of it actually you were quite interested in in it from the outset and you were very forthcoming with uh you had a kind of an attitude that like you know if you choose not to use ai you're going to basically get left behind do you remember that during the early yeah, days and, and this whole thing reminds me a lot of when the World Wide web came about um, Microsoft really missed the boat and they didn't really think it was very important. And um, Netscape took off, you know, and mm -hmm. in those days, it was kind of like, I remember I um, was hired by a large architecture firm to build their website. And in those days, this was like 97, um, 98, maybe everything was hand coded. It was before like Dreamweaver existed and you had to just make a website in a text editor. And um, I went around to all the architecture principals, these middle-aged people who were kind of at the top of their career. And I was, I was a young guy, 20 something. And I was there to get their bios and pictures and like a little write-up of the different projects that they've done. Mm -hmm. And nobody, not even one of the, about a dozen principals thought it was important. And they all blew me off and just forget it. They didn't do it really <laughs> because they didn't think a website was important yeah and yeah the, it's not the, going to take off and the only thing they thought it would be would be like a replacement for their brochure a printed oh, thing oh yeah and i yeah, was like yeah. i was i'm always been like forward thinking and into tech and i'm like no this is going to be a big thing you know and mm. i just the principal or the the ceo of the company saw the benefit i think in those days it was like the idea that if you want to be ahead of the curve, you would get a website. Mm. Mm. And, and so he, he wanted to do that, but then most of the bell curve of the firm didn't want to. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, um, I was, I was just grateful to you because I would probably be a bit creeped out by AI. I'd be like, Oh, I don't want to be, and I still am. There's still, I still have loads of reservations we can talk to in a bit, but I think as a good entry point for you and I into this discussion, um, 
one of the things I really adore about um, AI is that it can basically do everything and it can do everything really, really well. But for some reason, it just can't do sacred geometry. You know, yeah. like when I say, please draw me a seven pointed star, it says, no problem. Here is your star. And it's always eight pointed. You know, I, did, and I, I actually and did I, that. I did that yesterday as a, to see if uh, for Omni had gotten smarter. And has it? No. No, <laughs> it's either you're getting an eight or a six. And even if you go, please, 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 could you just do a nine or a 15 pointed star? Yeah. And it kind of gets back to you and says, absolutely, no problem. Please enjoy your. Yeah. Your and then, then, I, then I point out, star. I say, no, that you you actually gave me an eight pointed star. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, oh, I'm sorry. And then I, I'll make another one, a seven pointed star <laughs> as requested. Yeah. And then it gives you another eight pointed star and it says, enjoy your seven pointed star. <laughs> <laughs> So it's kind of it's I I enjoy kind of like finding like little touch points with these technologies where for some reason it just can't handle geometry. And because that's our core passion, I suppose, um, it's just really interesting, isn't it? Now, don't get me wrong. I, I'm blown away by by these technologies and I have come to really admire how they can help us, you know, certainly with our productivity and stuff, you know, but. But let's dive into like, isn't it interesting that geometry seems to be outside the the bounds of possibility for the algorithm in its well, current state? I'm it's, sure it it's will a catch weird up. thing. Like in their demo I watched the other day, they had a triangle, and that demo is for like teaching kids, and they the the adult and the kids sat together, and they had the camera of the phone looking at this geometrical problem, which was a triangle. And the AI was like, um, can you tell me which one is the hypotenuse? And the kid was like, he he guessed wrong and he guessed the, the a, adjacent side. And uh -huh. um, so it, it understood the triangle. It understood the parts of the triangle. It understood trigonometry. So it was getting geometry. It was understanding mm. that but it doesn't understand the qualitative geometry that we're interested in. Like when mm -hmm. you, there's a qualitative difference in how you feel with a seven pointed mandala versus an eight. Mm -hmm. And for AI, it's kind of all the same. It doesn't, and I, I think this gets to the core of it. It's that the AI doesn't have qualia. It doesn't understand the, the feeling difference between these things because for it, any kind of eight pointed mandala would be pretty and it's all the same to it. It doesn't, doesn't understand why would I be asking for a seven pointed? And so it supplies me with an eight pointed and it's, it thinks the job is done. Mm. And it, it just gets down to the essence that it doesn't, it's not conscious like we are. It's not aware. Mm. It, it mm. doesn't know what it's like. It, it can't, experience the taste of chocolate or the beauty of the sunset or the 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 sound of the music it, it's it's an it's an emulation of all of these things and we we get tricked into thinking that it understands but it mm. doesn't it doesn't really understand anything at all it's mm. it's just a, a um i think we're deceived to think that it understands but mm. at the same time I don't really, when I go look up something on Wikipedia or even the internet in general, I don't, I'm not put off by the fact that Google doesn't understand anything because mm -hmm. I'm using it as a tool to help me find information. And AI is a, a fantastic new evolution of that tool mm. and giving me information in, in a new way. But I, it doesn't understand like a human being understands. Mm -hmm. And I think this, mm -hmm. this doesn't, this get to the essence of, of what it, what our value is as human beings is that we, we comprehend, we get the totality of it. We get the gestalt. We see the forest from the trees. We, we make the connections. We get it. Whereas AI is just a, a very incredible tool that we can use. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have those, those 
critical qualities that we naturally have with, and we have those qualities without effort. We don't have to like mm -hmm. sit down and do computation to um, know what a seven pointed mandala feels like. Mm -hmm. We don't, we, our brains don't get hot and, and, and we run out of computing resources, <laughs> you know, trying to, we don't. Well, yeah. yeah I'm lo loving like what that. you're saying. Yeah. It's kind of like, I, let me try and articulate this. It's something like by, by understanding what AI is and what it can do, um, somehow in that process, we get awakened to um, what it can't do. And in so doing, we sort of point a mirror back to ourselves in a way where we actually get a newfound way of seeing what it is that makes humanness unique, something like that, you know? Yeah. And so I was thinking, right, like, let's say I look at a daisy, for example, right? And I trip out on daisies because I know that there's a pentagonal geometry underneath them. I know that there's Fibonacci on the seed head. I know that the whole daisy is formed by geometry, right? But I just kind of carry that in my back burner of my mind. But to be honest, when I look at a daisy, right, there's a sort of a depth that I can get to where I just kind of like see it as beautiful. I just see it as awesome that this is like a naturally occurring um, flower that grows out of the ground and exhibits all this geometry effortlessly. And so, you, I, you know, I don't do this all the time, but like I can find my way into kind of like a meditation with the daisy, right? Now, I couldn't tell you like what a daisy is made up of and what sort of photosynthesis takes place and why the stem is green and the seed head is yellow. But ChatGPT can give me all of that, right? I can find out every single chemical composition of the seed head versus the petals. I've no idea what any of those things are, but I'm pretty sure if I, I know that ChatGPT is good at that type of stuff, right? But where I find it kind of enjoyable is like, wow, that's really cool. And I love knowing all that information. If someday I might want to know why the stem is green and the seed head is yellow. But, but what, what I'm finding more relevant is that it's, it seems to be shining a spotlight on what humanness is when it's, when it's kind of like placed alongside AI intelligence you know like it's it's almost like i'm getting a clearer insight into ah that's what makes us conscious beings you know i think it gets to the experience of holding the daisy and examining it closely and marveling at its beauty in that mm. moment of appreciation in that moment of experiencing of being aware that that's what it's like to be a human mm. and also, as humans, we can learn all the facts and all the things that we can get go into the science of the daisy and find out all about biology and learn things that are practical. But that's where AI is way better at because it, it mm. has like all of the textbooks in it. It has all of that cross-linked information that people have found out and all the poetry written about flowers. It's in there. So yeah. you can get all that information from it um, whenever you want. And and that's maybe interesting, but for us, all of that is the value of that <clears throat> is really just to enhance our experience. Mm. Don't you think mm. it all comes yeah, back to like, the experiencing? Yeah, absolutely. That's it. It's like, I'm just trying to think we've kind of come at this, like, I think almost by accident in a way where because sacred geometry had a little speed bump with AI in the early days, at least, it'll probably work it out now in time but it let us see something that AI couldn't do. And so it kind of led us on a little bit of a journey rather than trying to understand everything that AI could do, what's it capable of, which most of the population of the planet are rushing to, which is a fantastic activity, by the way. And I'm interested in that as well. But what's, what's also kind of an interesting side project is trying to discover what AI can't do. You know, it's kind of there the fun areas around the edges, because the more you get close to seeing what it can't do, um, the more you get close to realizing what it is that makes us us, you know, and you're exactly right. It's that it's the ability to experience 
anything actually not just a daisy you know it's the, each other's company to be in a landscape and to be able to really be present with it um these things are like probably like you know but 20 years ago when we had our phones wired to the wall this was we would just sound like madmen right now you know talking like this where that was just like life before the internet you know what i mean where now we're like, oh, we have this incredible capacity to to be present in the landscape. You know, it's kind of like it's just kind of being a normal human. You know what I mean? But where, people where have now forgotten. It's like people this... have forgotten that, and they're so into yeah. their screens that yeah. um, it's uh, <clears throat> you have to remind them of the utility of paper. I know. I yeah. know you're kind of unusual amongst people I know in that you write things in a notebook, and you um, bet love it Look, and there, the proof, you know and that there's a lot of utility to that isn't there it, there's yeah. no there's no lag there's no losing a file i mean i guess you could yeah. lose the whole notebook but um <laughs> there there's a sort of dead simple reliability mm. of paper that i i think that a lot of people have kind of forgotten about <laughs> you know there's something you know? else there scott and, and I got this recently when drawing geometry, right? Um, and, you know, I love to do the meditations, like the visual meditations that we share on Zoom and we have these digital sacred geometric journeys, which are fabulous, right? But uh, when we draw with our own pen and pencil on the paper, there's a closeness to the geometry where I find when it goes onto the screen, there's definitely a degree of separation or a few degrees of separation, at least for me, um, when it goes onto the screen, it feels further away. It feels like not as intimate actually as when you draw. And so when, when you're writing, if you're just writing in a journal, you know, your pen on paper, um, it's a phenomenal act in a way, you know, I'm kind of laughing at ourselves here because we're kind of like, I would just love our if our 15 year old selves could hear us talk about, you know, hey, getting a pen and writing on paper is really something. But it's almost like needs to be said today, doesn't it? Because of where we've gone with AI and what it can do. You know, it's yeah, the world is is so different. It is. And and I, I'm lucky that I got to draw by hand in my early days in school and my early career. I was a manual draftsman and um, that's not done anymore at all. And and there's a certain immediacy of 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 the design that you're working on is something that you've touched with your hands, that you've drawn everything with your hands. Mm. It, it becomes much more organic and part of you than the computer you know i'm really an expert mm. at the computer and design software and in fact i'm building a course right now on autocad architecture 2025 wow. and um and yet it's not as pleasing as the old drawing board was for some really? reason yeah it's not i mean you can do so much more than you used to be able to do but it's not as fulfilling mm -hmm. as it once was. Well, let's as as, as an architect, you know, as a designer, it's not as like yeah, it's not as I don't know embodied. Mm. Yeah. Well, I wanted to um, I wanted to ask you, um, changing gears a little bit. Uh, what has been one thing that you've done with um, AI or I know ChatGPT is probably the one you use the most. Same here, by the way. But give me an example of something where you went, oh, my God, this is cool. Like, this is amazing. I love this. This is blowing my mind. I'll share one with you after. Sure. Well, I made a, de a deck of cards uh, that I call the notable deck. And there are all these historical figures um, all the way from. 3000 BC up to the present. And I, I also have dabble in stable diffusion, which is the text to image. So I was able to make portraits of all these people. And it really blew my mind at how, how good they are, how, how amazing these portraits are. 
And then mm -hmm. on the back of the cards, there's all information about each person's life and something, a quote they said, and the most notable things about their lives. And the AI was just filling all of that in for me. I had to very carefully construct the queries that I used to prompt it to give me that information. But oh. it really blew my mind that it just is this well of information. And it mm -hmm. really is up to your creativity to tap into that. And what I found was it's like a co it's like the collective consciousness of humanity. It's mm -hmm. available there. And you can you can find out anything. And I would go on these kind of journeys where I would look up a historical figure, learn something about them, and then that would lead to questions about this movement they were involved in. And then I would learn about other people and other things, and I would just keep going for hours and just Dandies interacting with because I found that a lot of times, like especially when I was younger in school, I would come to the end of my teacher's knowledge at some point, or their patience more likely. <laughs> and and that arrested the the line of inquiry that I was going on. Mm -hmm. And then I might never have gotten back to that. But with AI, you can follow these chains of thought as deeply and as widely as you like. Um, because it never tires of answering your questions. Never tires. Yeah. And it's, actually, it's... I, the problem was I would keep hitting the limit of I've asked 50 <laughs> questions of GPT and I have to wait two hours <laughs> before it will it let me ask more questions. And I'm like, ah, yeah. so there is a there is a limit. But yeah, it, like last year, I think it was 20 questions. And now it's I think it's 80 questions you can ask. So like they're increasing. That. Is that in a day or in an hour or in, in I think it's in a two hour period, something like okay. that. Okay. Okay. And yeah. then because they don't want you to set up a bot type of thing where you're just like mining it. Um, uh -huh. Gotcha. Um, but I, I kept hitting that <laughs> limit, you know, and then I'm like, <laughs> damn, now I've got to stop, you know? Um, yeah. But that it's wonderful for exploration of knowledge but I, I feel like i'm super rare and that almost nobody's doing that i would think i don't you know? know scott because i mean you've got a inquiring mind better than anyone i know but i mean i found myself particularly when gpt enabled being able to talk to it on your phone i could be in the car and i'll give you one that i really enjoyed I'd heard one time, right, that there was sacred geometry embedded in silicon. You know, the element silicon, which is responsible for all the microchips in our computers. And um, I did this deep dive into an examination of like, one, what is silicon? How is it made? Where does it come from? It basically comes from sand. And well, it the, is an element, I mean, you know, and it's an element. So it's literally an element. Yeah. yeah. And they, they, boil down sand to, to the bare element i think you know silica or whatever silica and then yeah. our silica and then um they put this i don't know i guess a tiny drop of this stuff on a microchip right and then if if i'm remembering it right there's there's billions of these on off switches on on the tiniest thing that's in our phones like like billions of these switches that either are on or off i well, don't know how they do that like the, i don't know how the integrated circuit substrate is uh, made of silicon, which yeah. is just a lattice. And then all of these semiconductors are put on top of that, which are like switches, on-off switches. And there are literally yeah. billions of them in a CPU. A and there's a whole like, like so street plan, you like an urban design plan, if you will, etched into the silicon. And that's that provides the pathways for these electrons to move along. And that is what allows this kind of classical computation to take place. And isn't that awesome? So in our iPhones, which fits in our hands, there's like a couple of these processors, I think. And then on those printed circuit boards, there's billions. Like that's a very large mm -hmm. quantity. I'm just amazed at the microscopic nature of yeah. how do they get 
billions of on off switches on something probably smaller than our little fingernail. I just kind of get blown away. And I'd be asking yeah. ChatGP this as I go, you know. But anyway, I got finally to where I wanted to go with it. And it was explaining to me, I said, is there sacred geometry, you know, at the base layer of silicon? And it said, yes. In fact, silicon is made up of tetrahedrons. Basically, it's called a tetrahedral lattice. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what it is at its most foundational level. And then I was kind of thinking, wow, like, isn't that cool? Like everything that's going on here is probably couldn't happen without silicon, I'm guessing. I'm not like a, a very techie right. person, so I don't know. But I'm pretty sure if we didn't have silicon in our processors or whatever, um, or in our computers, we wouldn't be able to do this Zoom, I guess, you know? Um, so, but isn't it fascinating to think that like that material or that element at its very foundational layers, just pure tetrahedrons. That is. Pure and every, everything is geometry in the end. You know, you've seen yeah. the orbital uh, electron clouds of the hydrogen atom in, in my book and yes. how beautiful they are. And they're like little sacred geometries, each one. Um, yeah. So, it's, I mean, it's all ge geometry in the end. And it's fascinating that with computers, we've gotten down to I think the state of the art is a three nanometer chip design and an atom is about one nanometer. So we're really, really Whoa. close to the scale of an, an atom um, and we can't really get any smaller. So we're, we're hitting the, the, the limit. Um, Sorry, what's that Scott? That's down to a nanometer. I am um, what the, the uh, scale like... of an, the scale of an atom. So, um, Oh yeah. The scale... And, but we can put transistors of that we size. Can make, we can make, um, I think um, five nanometers is the more advanced chip design right now. Uh -huh. um, like the Apple M4 processor is, I think it's a five nanometer process, but I know that they're working on the three nanometers now. Um, and then the next generation of chips will be down to that scale. And so I don't think we can really go any smaller than that because now you're bumping into the, at the atoms themselves. And mm -hmm. um, that's going to limit, I don't know if that's going to, Moore's law is going to hit a wall maybe, um, but we'll mm -hmm. probably find other ways of increasing um, computation aside from size, decreasing size. Um, yeah. There's other, there's other methods like three dimensional chips that um, mm -hmm. take this two, two dimensional urban plan into like a three-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. um, and also quantum computers are coming on board and they're increasing. I think they have like yeah. a thousand qubit computers now, which is um, getting to be much more powerful. And that that's mm -hmm. a whole different class of, of computers that work in a totally different way. Um, mm. And that promises perhaps to have a different kind of encryption which we, okay. might need, we might eventually need to go to as quantum computers themselves will be able to break through encryption, mm, which um, of any kind, that's going to be a real problem, a real big yeah. problem. And, uh, and so at some point we're going to have a massive disruption as the world moves from classical to quantum computers, um, probably in about a decade. Yeah. Um, you know, but AI is going to be very mature then. So AI might be starting to be used to solve problems. I was just watching mm -hmm. a video yesterday about this man who was like a chess prodigy when he was like nine. And he ended up um, going into AI and he made um, the first um, like deep mind computer that beat the human um, in chess in the 90s oh yeah i remember that and, yeah, and big blue he, or something was it yeah and then he that made famous um, thing yeah alpha go and it beat the the best go players in the world that was like 20 years oh, later yes. i've heard of this and then, yeah. then he made alpha zero and alpha zero is like a general purpose computer that can learn any two-person game mm -hmm. and so he asked it to learn chess and it, in nine hours, it was able to beat all human beings. Wow. And wow. that's, that's, Incredible. that's scary that you can give this, like you give it the rules of the game 
and in the beginning in the first hour it's just all random it just it's losing uh-huh. mostly and then in like four hours it's like really good and then nine yeah. hours it's like way better than anyone can ever yeah you know, no one can challenge i had him i heard a, a critique of that actually where i think it's very um it's a very good way to demonstrate the power of technology when it comes to playing a game against a human and there was some I, I can't remember the name of the person unfortunately but the critique went something like this it was that um we're not really teaching the computer how to play chess what we're doing is teaching the computer to make a succession of decisions much much faster than than any human ever could so what well, they... it's, and it, and it's not just you're right but it's not just speed like with go uh-huh. the the alpha go had strategies that no one had ever seen before and people have been playing wow. go for 2000 years it's the world's oldest board game wow. and so it it had a whole new strategies that were very novel that no one had ever come up with that it used to win and wow. uh, and so it was it was creative it wasn't just fast like in the early okay. days of the chess computers they were fast yeah and and, the, and they were programmed um by humans with rules but that's that's fundamentally different than the machine learning that they have now where they don't tell it any rules they i mean they tell it the rules of the game but they don't mm-hmm. they don't they don't have a whole decision tree about if uh-huh. this happens then do that they don't they don't say any of that and they let it figure it out on its own and wow. so consequently we don't really understand how it solves the problem because we it it's not written in a way that we can understand it's really mm. just a matrix of math that gets optimized over time and it takes mm. a lot of computing resources to build a model like that and the guy was talking about the latest models that they're building, like for ChatGPT or uh, Claude or um, these these large companies that are making um, AIs like Google or Meta. They take um, as much um, electrical energy as New York City consumes, like really? five, five gigawatts to build like a model um, of this wow. scale. And about a hundred billion dollars in computers. <laughs> but that's all going to come down as well, isn't it? Like Moore's law you mentioned there, you know, which is basically like the um what is it, the processing power of computers doubles every two years or 18 months or something, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does, but um the the point that they're at now is staggering like nvidia makes these these chips the h100s that are i think they're fifty thousand dollars and they're the size mm-hmm. of a tabletop um but the amount of processing that they can do is is staggering and yet they mm-hmm. they have whole data centers full of them a hundred billion dollars worth of computing compute yeah is used to make these models i mean and that so that means that only the world's largest corporations can afford it Mm. and and then once they make that model it can then be used to answer everyone's questions wow i mean let's dive into the dark side of it a little bit you know so i mean i I know there's loads of um, fear around, you know, the robots are going to take over and get guns and kill us all. So I know that's one fear, but I don't really worry about that one too much, to be honest. I'm probably wrong in that, but I don't. Um, But what I'm worried about more is kind of the centralization of it. You know, like you're saying, if it's $100 billion to make these and only very expensive companies can do it. And then if you combine the centralized nature of the big AIs with their capacity to survey I guess everything we're doing because it's owned by a private company, isn't it? Chat GPT. So, you know, however many millions upon millions of people all speaking their deepest secrets into this machine, um, like it's it's unnerving um how that data could be used back upon us for well, me. Yeah, and also how people will be uh always talking with it and 
and also videoing everything around them with it. Mm. And it will therefore know everything that you have inside your house. And, um, mm. and um, I just looked on chat GPT on the, what it knows about me. And it like, Oh yeah. It, Cause I've asked it questions, you know, and it, okay. it knows like what kind of computer I have and a bunch of things. And I'm like, I don't really, is there some benefit that it would know that? Like, so I deleted it. Um, uh huh. But like, it's going to build up a model of everything that you've ever said to it. And yeah, you're right. That's very frightening in terms of surveillance. And I mean, it might be useful in terms of um, it gets to know you better so it can answer your questions better. But <laughs> that that could also See, I backfire. think that's probably how yeah. yeah how it'll be sold to us, you know. But I I as I use it more and more, and I kind of like I've been pretty unbridled in my in my using of it. Only recently I've started questioning. Hang on a minute, like who is ChatGPT and what do they do with all this data? Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, you and I would have sort of just very straightforward objections to decentralized algorithms like um, Facebook and Instagram. And it's just, you feel like it, you're just being reduced down to a unit or commoditized um, yeah. in a way that's very um, unfulfilling, I would say. Um, and But AI is so rewarding at the moment. It's a bit like I'm, I'm feeling I'm not seeing the catch at the moment do you know what i well, mean well it's it's because it reminds me of the, enjoying the rewards it, it's just like the early days of the internet there was all this promise of how it was going to connect everyone and if we just were connected um all the world's problems would be solved because we would understand each other and we yeah. would we would we would that's what that's what we didn't have is that understanding and and now it's by the way it's it far from that like now. that at the beginning though yeah at the, there was a little moment where I remember there was a thing called Soul Seek. I know it's probably illegal now, but you could get every spiritual teaching that ever existed or Napster, remember that? Or you could just meet communities into like very niche interests and it was very peer to peer. It did feel much more like a freedom technology. Yeah. But but it, it when it got devoured by like five or six companies, it really changed. You I know? agree. And, really, I th and I think we're in that we're in that early stage right now with AI. Where, it, mm. where it's like, oh, wow, this the is going to this is gonna be wonderful. It's going to like do all these great things. And yeah. it's hard to know how much that's going to be corrupted, mm -hmm. you know, and how yeah. quickly and, and whether we can ever go back. In a way, I don't think we can because there's too much money involved. You know, these mm. companies are investing hundreds of billions maybe trillions of dollars in this tech mm -hmm. it's not like they can go back and say oh we're gonna, we're not going to do ai we're just gonna <laughs> we've changed yeah. our minds yeah we're not gonna yeah, integrate I think, ai yeah i don't i don't think that's going to happen to be honest well you they'll know? just go out of business um, because other people will yeah and their products yeah. will be better and yeah there'll be a laughing stock it's sort of can you imagine a company that's like um a software company that that doesn't have a website that doesn't believe in the web or the internet it's yeah like they're it's not going to work that doesn't happen it doesn't exist yeah yeah i'd feel a bit more comfortable if like open ai was kind of like you know some sort of open source decentralized thing where you know i'm not a developer but you know people could see the code and and nobody owned your data and you know that would be much more comforting to me you well, know that was elon this... musk's involvement early on with open ai even in the name open ai mm. was supposed to be an open source thing but oh, was it was that elon's vibe yeah but it's oh, i didn't know it's that. no longer um so we have to trust the developers in some regard um mm. which is hard to do because there's so much money in, involved that and it hasn't really worked out like with abs else. absolute power sort of corrupts doesn't it yeah and when you have, you know it there's does. like trillions of dollars on the line it's real easy to uh yeah to to become um beholden to those forces rather than yeah. the idealism of youth you know i'm really thinking about like the more ai is going to like 
take its foothold in the world. Um, I do see this kind of like space for a kind of a new social movement where people are going to really get it that, you know, the inner light of their own awareness, you know, and this type of ability to dwell in your own interiority will soon become kind of the only space in the world, in the universe, where you're free from, um, you know, any type of commodification or surveillance, actually, you know, and I kind of I'm kind of hopeful in a way that like the more people that because I've spoken to loads of people just in, you know, random people. And and this is, you know, I, I'm hearing this back independently from people that they're kind of saying we, the only place we really have to go is like that back home to who we ultimately are, you know. Um, and then the other thing I was thinking was. And it's kind of linked, you know, this, the more you come home to who you are, you know, the more you kind of land with like just connecting with yourself genuinely, um, the more you're available then to really meet others, you know, and, um, and there's something about, you know, coming together in small groups, eye to eye, heart to heart, that I see that becoming something that AI will never be able to replicate, you know, like, like sort of experiencing your own awareness and then sharing that with others in person. I mean, what a beautiful thing that AI could kind of inadvertently end up promoting. It would be kind of like a, a not a rebellion, but it would be a sort of a natural, um, kind of cause and effect thing from the hold that, that AI is going to have over all of us. Does that make any sense? It does. And I, I think there's going to be a huge backlash against AI, yeah. um, especially when people start losing their jobs in mass. Mm. Um, yeah. We haven't even begun to see that happen on a, on the scale that it's going to happen. Mm. And, and so people are going to be, looking for meaning they're going to be like what is i don't i used to get my meaning from my job now i don't have a job mm. um and maybe they'll solve some of those issues with handouts i don't know maybe ai will be used to help solve that problem but Ironically. at the end of the day if it doesn't like outright kill us all uh and we're 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 um, supported in some way we still have the problem of finding meaning and that is exacerbated mm -hmm. because we don't get the meaning from our efforts from our work that we're doing mm -hmm. so there's going to be a hunger for connecting with something real and I, I i'm biased but i think sacred geometry is a wonderful pathway into that and i think these traditional activities of pencil and paper are going to become much more attractive, especially when people start rejecting everything having to do with computers and phones. I don't know. Could happen. Yeah. Offline, organic, micro movements type of thing. I do yeah. see it. I really do. But I, I I, I'm, not a, I'm not a rejecter. I, I'm an embracer of tech, which yeah. is funny, but... I, I think there's there's still it's 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 actually an incredible and uh, transformative invention that we ought mm -hmm. to leverage in a positive way. Mm. But but it's up to us to actually interact with it and find those positive ways mm. and not just become a victim of the corporations, you know. Mm -hmm. Because while while that may be happening. There's also this wonderful opportunity to use it to learn and to con communicate and to enhance and to augment our natural abilities. And it puts us in a higher order of creativity. Like you don't have mm -hmm. to like do all the work. You can get it to do the work, but you can direct it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, and you, imagine the kind of movies that will come out shortly when they, the, like OpenAI has this thing called Sora which is a video mm. technology that's kind of in beta. Um, but I see it as the bar has been lowered for creating movies. Imagine the mm. creativity that could come forth 
when yes, more and more direct people are able to make hundred million dollar movies for a thousand dollars or something. I know, you know, I know. Yeah, no, there's incredible potential. And you know, I mean, we shouldn't knock it too hard because like we are in the honeymoon phase and, and I, I'm certainly deriving much more value than than I am being um you know no, nothing uh, negative has happened to me yet about AI yeah. you know so yeah. I don't want to preempt and and I do think I take your point that it's up to us to become good choosers about how we interact with the technology you know I probably have some reservations around you know because these companies are so strong and so powerful it probably the power balance is a little bit skewed in their favor you know that that how much of it is really um you know this expansive opportunity to express our souls completely that there must be limits bounded somewhere in these algorithms you know uh which you know but that's you know that's more of a invitation to kind of like explore consciousness on your own terms i guess you know i i see i think when you mentioned backlash there i'm excited about the backlash because i think in a way like whatever ai does it's going to do right but there's 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 something about a backlash to it i'm not saying the backlash is in bring ai down or ai is bad or anything i'm not really saying that i'm just saying ai is probably just going to do what it's going to do irrespective of any of us you know but in the doing what it's doing, we will, as a species, have a reaction to that. And I'm quite optimistic about that reaction. I'm interested in that, yeah. where that might go. You I know? think because it, it will teach us more about what it means to be human. Like we were exactly. saying earlier That's on the, this talk. Yeah. Like when we yeah. realize what if AI is so good at these things and we're out of a job, what are we good at? natively yeah, exactly. like what what is yeah. it that we're that we're sort of meant to be doing as human beings in these human bodies on this planet how, how can we maybe we should clean up the planet and like yeah maybe you know or i don't know there's there's sort of an optimal thing we should maybe we get back we, to yeah becoming like telepathic and you know get back in being able to you know become proficient at teleportation between planets and galaxies or, um, or, that or sp stuff. spiritual travel in a way like you, yeah you don't have to leave your living room but you can astrally <laughs> travel there you know exactly all that good yeah. stuff lucid dreaming you know all of our latent capacities you know it's what we have the time and energy to invest in but i think that's a nice place to leave it scott um i am um, i i definitely feel more hopeful about it um than negative about it you know but it's nice to talk about the dark side too because it is it's worth considering, you know, there's loads of opinions out there. It's nice to add ours to the mix. I hope it was enjoyable to listen to. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, see you next time. Mm -hmm.